Let's pray. Father, thank you that a merry heart is like good medicine. And uh, I would pray tonight that we would learn, we would have a great time. We would realize that it's enjoyable. It's fun learning the Bible and learning to apply it to our lives. So tonight, God, we're asking for your favor. We completely recognize that you are our teacher. Um, It's your voice that these precious people need to hear tonight. So, Lord, will you help us to find relevant uh, application um, some 3,000 years uh, after these events actually take place? So, for your glory, um, we're gathered under you, the banner of your love. Help us to, uh, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. Amen. I knew I had a Bible over here somewhere. Looks like this. Where are we at? This is called stalling. Judges chapter, uh, Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now that you're there in Judges chapter 8, put a finger, a bookmark, something in there, and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6. <laughs> Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you, buddy said this uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. It said, take heed that you do not do your charitable... <laughs> take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you, not if, but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. I like this passage of Scripture because Jesus reminds us that he sees everything, everything that we do. Hebrews 4.13, I think it says that nothing in creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is open and laid bare before him who we must give an account. And the great thing about that is that he sees our acts of righteousness and he promises to reward us one day and, and, and... Even if they go unnoticed on earth, he's keeping some pretty good records. So uh, last year, there was a a sudden rainstorm on a a Sunday morning during one of our Sunday services, and and Andy was told by one of the guys that uh, there was a gold sedan out in the parking lot with his windows, windows rolled what? Down. So he asked Daniel back there to, uh, to uh, go and find the owner and get the keys and uh, get the windows rolled up for him, and that's what he did. So, uh, so the good servant that he is, he, he goes out into the rainstorm, getting soaked, finds the gold sedan, and indeed discovers that, guess what, guess what, the windows are down, right? The windows, the windows are down, sticks the key in the door. And the door won't open. The door won't open. He tries the key in the passenger side door. It still won't open. So being a genius, he sticks his arm through the open door, (laughs) through the open, through the open side door uh, window. And as he unlocks the door manually, opens up the door, and the result of his success was being greeted by the sound of the vehicle's car alarm. All right. So knowing uh, how many people are armed at our church, he immediately starts looking around to make sure that he's not about to be bum-rushed by our, uh, by our security team. In addition to that, he's starting to panic even more, thinking that this blaring horn, you know, is actually disrupting the, uh, the service. And uh, again, being the genius that he is, he knows that... Uh, all he needs to do to stop the alarm is to put the key in the ignition. So he'll be able to roll up the windows, but that'll, that'll, 
stop the, uh, the alarm as well. So he gets in the car, quickly sticks the key in the ignition, and it won't turn. It, w- it won't turn. Being undeterred, he continues to jiggle the key, hoping it'll start. Now, keep in mind, the alarm is still blaring, and he's no longer outside the car, appearing to break in. He is now inside the vehicle, looking like the guy in Grand Theft Auto. All right. So finally, the proper amount of wiggling and jiggling happens, and the vehicle starts, and Daniel is able to close the windows and relock the, uh, the car. Now he is drenched from his second shower <laughs> of the day. Daniel, uh, being the dutiful young man that he is, reports back to Andy, mission accomplished, sir, and started heading back to the sanctuary where he bumps into Jason Pranzo, who had been the guy who had originally told Andy about the sedan with the windows down. Jason suggests that they get some towels to go back to the car and wipe down the drenched seats so the owner doesn't get a wet hiney, right, when they, when they go and they sit in the car. So they acquire the proper amount of paper towels. Again, they head back out in the rain to accomplish servant task number two. And as Daniel starts to open the sedan's door, Jason says, this isn't the vehicle that I told Andy about. <laughs> I told Andy it was a silver sedan that was several cars away from the vehicle that Daniel had just broken into. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. <sighs> no wonder the key would not open the gold sedan's door. Daniel was at another random vehicle that also had their windows down. Um, I sort of go like this. Um, For you young kids, back in the olden days, they didn't have power windows. You actually had to manually, oh, it was was horrible, manually had to crank them up, right? So here's the point. Well, there's, there's more to the story. When they found the actual owner of the car, Daniel told them the story, and the owner said, it must be a miracle that you were able to start my car with another vehicle's ignition key and be able to roll up the windows. And Daniel responded with, it could be a miracle, but I think that considering how long the alarm was going off, the real miracle is that the police were never called and I didn't land up in jail, right? (laughs) Here's the point. True servanthood. True servanthood will always include a cost. And in, in Daniel's case, in Daniel's case, it, it probably cost him a couple of ticks off the old heart, right? A couple of ticks off the old heart uh, during the panic. And it certainly cost him getting, getting soaked and could have cost him spending a night uh, in the pokey for car burglary, but, but that didn't happen. Here's why I'm sharing that particular story tonight. I have no particular reason. I just thought it was funny. I wanted to share it. Of course, I have a reason. I never tell an illustration that doesn't tie into what we're going through. I want us to be able to get an appreciation of servanthood this side of heaven, even when it's not acknowledged. I said a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night uh, that the true test of a servant is when they're treated like a servant, when nobody notices all the things they do, like, uh, like Miss K right now is over in the admin room, and she's doing a bunch of bookkeeping and administration stuff, and she likes just working behind the scenes, and she'll have so many, uh, so many treasures stored in heaven for that. Well, maybe not. Maybe I just took them by telling you, but uh, no, she'll, she'll, uh, she'll still get them. But here's the deal. Even though we may get disrespected for our attempt to serve uh, as in the case of Gideon, we're gonna, we saw that last, last time, and we're going to see it again tonight. But when we're willing to serve unconditionally with the right heart and with the right motives, we're going to see and do things for the Lord that can really only be described as a miracle. And God is about to do another miracle through, uh, through Gideon's small army in, uh, in, defeating, in defeating the Midianites. Somehow my... My chair keeps getting moved around here, so I don't have to keep going like this to look at you. Now, there you are. Thanks for showing up tonight. So you remember, you remember what happened last time. Gideon, Gideon was in hot pursuit, hot pursuit. Remember, we're in chapter 8. We're going to go through the second half of this. Gideon was in hot pursuit of the Midianites 
who they battled in chapter 7. He uh, and his 300 mighty men of valor are exhausted, yet they continue the pursuit. Why did they do that? Because the enemy was going to get away. And if you didn't underline that last time uh, when we were in chapter 7, just underline. They were exhausted. It says the scriptures say they were exhausted, but still in pursuit. As he is chasing the Midianites east, he rolls through a city. Do you remember what city he came through first? It's called Sukkoth. Sukkoth. And uh, these, these are his brethren through the extended, uh, uh, well, their extended family through the tribe of Dan. And what does he do? He asks these people in Sukkot, hey, can you hook us up with uh, 300 Wendy's combo meals or something? They wanted, actually said that they wanted some barley. They wanted some barley bread. That's all he asks for. It's not much of a request. But the men of Sukkot told him what? Remember what happened? He said, no way, Jose. Why? Because they're thinking, well, we're not assured that you're going to win this battle. Because the Midianites have how many men? They have 15,000 men, right? They have 15,000 men, and you still have your 300. We're not sure, so we're not going to put all our chips in on you. And uh, so if you lose and the Midianites find out that we helped you, guess who's going to be next on their hit list? So uh, no way. Jose, we're not going to give you uh, any food. Um, Gideon says, no problem. Thanks anyway. Have a nice day. Well, that's not exactly what he says. He said, uh, you should have feared getting a beat down from me, because we've got the Lord on our side, and we are going to win this battle, and when we win this battle, I'm coming back to settle up, uh, to settle up accounts with you. I'm going to put a little whoop on you through the briar patch, whatever that means, right? So what does he do? He chuggles down, down the road to another city named Penuel, and they foolishly give him what? The same exact treatment that the people of Sukkot did. So Gideon also promises them some retribution. Well, God has given the victory. Gideon now has the two Midianite kings in custody, and his, uh, he's on his way back to Sukkot for a little time of payback. Look at verse, look at verse 15. It says, Then Gideon came to the men of Sukkoth and said, here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? And true to his word, Gideon goes back, right? He goes back to Sukkoth with the captured Midianite kings, Zeba and Zalmunna. That's kind of funny names, right? Zeba, and which would you prefer to be if you had to choose to be one of those, Zeba or Zalmunna? You'd, you'd go Ziva? Everybody, Ziva? Not Zamuna? Be the only one in your class, I'm sure, right? And, uh, and he reminds them of their, their disrespectful, uh, ridiculing smack talk. Look at verse 16. And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkot. <laughs> he taught them. That's what he calls, I taught him. I put a beat down on him. I taught him. I taught him. He taught him a lesson all right. It sounds like he, uh, he gave them some squats with, uh, with a paddle of thorns. Look at the person next to you and say, ouch. Can you think of the paddle? Of the, Ow, that would, that's going to leave a mark, right? How many of you... I can see some people are about my age in here. How many of you remember growing up in an age where uh, the coaches, even the principal at your school, gave you, it was legal to give you swats? Anybody? Anybody remember those? Did you ever get swat? Oh, I bet you did. Anybody else? Okay. I got, well, I got a lot. Hey, who else got swats? And all these little softy millennial people here that, oh, yeah, no. No, we'd call Child Protective Services. Well, they didn't have Child Protective Services when, uh, when I was growing up. So, so our coaches would use, would, would use a paddle ball paddle. You know, paddle ball, paddle ball paddle, big side. Now, this may surprise you because I know that you see me as, I don't know, an angel. Um, 
uh, now, and you presume that that's how I was in years past, but my gym coaches in junior high and uh, senior high acquainted me with their paddle. So there would be, uh, and Coach Rose, I remember, I remember distinctly, I'm still seeing a therapist over Coach Rose. Yeah, he would, he, he took his paddle ball paddle, and before it was, before they started selling them like that, he drilled holes. Remember that? He drilled holes through the, you know what I'm talking about? Drilled holes in the paddle ball paddle uh, to enable maximum velocity and contact with, uh, with our behinds, right? And believe me, my backside was used as an example for other kids uh, not to mouth off to the coach. Oh, coach, we don't want to take another lap. Well, Mr. Blanc has just volunteered the whole class to take another lap. So as we were running another lap, not only was I getting swats when I came back, the other kids were not happy, so I was getting swats while we were doing the 440 track. And nobody else? Who else, who else can relate to that? Anybody? Damien? Give me some. Don't leave me hanging. All right, all right, all right. So in a similar way, the purpose here of Gideon is to let others know what happens when you disrespect God and when you disrespect God's servants. And this show of force, uh, as bloody as it was, is mild compared to what happens to the men of Penuel. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 17. Verse 17. Then Gideon tore down the tower of Penuel and killed, K-I-L-T, the men of the city. Killed them, Right? So Gideon continues to go through his to-do list for that day, stops by Penuel, rips down the tower, and kills the men of the city. Now, tearing down their expensive, elaborate lookout tower, that seems easy to understand. But croaking off the men of the city, that seems a little harsh, doesn't it? It seems a little harsh to us. And was this, was this the Lord's punishment? Was it the Lord's punishment uh, for their lack of faith or... Or was it just getting some Gideon, getting some, some vengeance on those who should have had his back? Well, you know what the Bible says, right? You know what the Bible tells us? Nothing. Yeah, we don't know. It doesn't tell us anything. So we can't be sure. What we can be sure of is what Paul says to the church at Rome. He says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He says, beloved, read it with me, read it with me, Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, when someone biblically wounds me, I don't have time to consider the whole verse, so the only portion of that verse that I remember are three words. Vengeance is mine, right? Can't do that, right? I don't have the luxury to do that because I, we also know what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Again, read with me. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. And add a little more to solidify. What the obedient thing, the obedient thing to do, Paul says this. This is Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Again, read them with me. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Who's taking a pair of scissors right now to that page in your Bible? That's a tough one, huh? So, what's just happened here? It sounds so unfair to me at times because, uh, well, how do you respond when someone has wounded you Biblically, unjustly, we'll use that, that word. Um, many of you have come to me and asked me 
that. And one of the things that I will always tell you is that when you're dealing with interpersonal conflict, there always needs to be an adult in the room. Someone has to be the adult or your conflict will just go on and on to the break of dawn. Somebody, somebody has to be the, the adult. You know what it's like when, uh, when a couple of your kids are going at it and you have to step in and be the grown-up. Someone truly has to act like a Christian and not respond with the same spiritual immaturity that someone has responded to you. It's never an easy thing to do because if you don't, guess what happens? You'll both be in sin. You'll both be in sin. It's easy to hold on to unforgiveness even knowing how much we have been forgiven. Now, on this topic of unforgiveness, let's just put it this way. There's a guy named Fred. He passes away, goes to heaven, shows up at the pearly gates, sees St. Peter there. This is a, not, a, not a true story, by the way, okay? Because there's nothing, nothing like this goes on in heaven. St. Peter's not greeting us at the gate, okay? As far as we know, nothing biblical about that. But anyway, for all intents and purposes, there's Peter at the gate, and this man, Fred, shows up, and he says, have I made it into heaven? And St. Peter says, well, not yet. Before you enter into heaven, I need you to spell one word for me. And he says, okay, well, what's the word? And he says, the word is love. And Fred looks back at him and says, love, L-O-V-E, love. Pete says, that's perfect. Come on in. So Peter stands there. Uh, doing the same thing over and over and over, and, and, and Fred watches him for a while, and Pete looks at the guy and says, hey, I need to take a break. <laughs> I need to take a break. Um, can you stand here and take my place for a little while? And Fred says, okay, I'll do it, but what do I need to do? And he says, well, you've been watching me this whole time. Just do exactly the same thing that I did with you. And the guy says, fine. A few minutes later, guess who shows up at the pearly gates? It's Fred's mean old ex-boss who unjustly fired him and damaged his reputation. He says, well, hi, Fred. I just had a massive heart attack, and, and I died. I guess I made it to heaven. And Fred says, hey, not quite, not quite yet, not quite yet. You have to spell one word for me before you can get into heaven. And so the, so the ex mini boss says, okay, no problem. What's the word? And Fred says, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> it's not an easy word. It's not an easy word to spell. Sounds like Fred is still hanging on to a little what? A little bitterness, a little anger, a little unforgiveness. You know anybody like that? You know anybody like that? Jesus says this. This is Matthew. Turn your Bibles. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, blessed are the... Well, read it with me. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Raise your hands if you want some mercy from the Lord. Okay, the rest of you don't care? Okay, I'll wait, I'll wait. How many of you want some mercy from the Lord? Yeah, that's right, every hand goes up. Um, well, that's how we can receive mercy from the Lord, by being merciful, merciful to others. If I'm desiring mercy from the Lord, others better be getting mercy from me. And that is the responsibility of every believer. So for whatever reason, Gideon doesn't show, Gideon doesn't show mercy to these guys. It's his extended kinfolk. And now he returns uh, his, his thought process back to who? Who's left standing in front of him? The two Midianite kings. Look at verse, look at verse 18. And he said to uh, Zeba and Zalmunna, I always want to say zebra, but I can't. He wants to say He'd be Dr. Doolittle then, right? And he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? And so they answered, as you are, so were they. That's the wrong thing to say to this guy. Each one resembled the son of a king. So they tell Gideon, dude, they looked a lot like you. <laughs> because they were members. Obviously, you know, they were members of Gideon's family, as we're going to see. Look at verse 19. Then Gideon said... They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. So in the culture of that day, uh, that's what you did. You avenged the murder of your kinfolk 
by, uh, by murdering them. Look at verse 20. So Gideon said to Jether, his firstborn, rise, kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. So Gideon gives his kid to uh, the opportunity for the reputation, uh, to earn the reputation of killing these two Midianite kings. But what happens? You know, the kid chicken, chickens out and uh, backs down. So the kings, the kings begin to mock Gideon. Look what they say in verse 21. So Ziba and Zalmunna said, well, why don't you rise yourself and kill us? For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and said, well, if you insist. And what does he do? He croaks them off. Yeah, he croaks off Ziba and Zalmunna. And he took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. So these, guys, these two kings are pretty cocky considering the position that they're in. And uh, they taunt Gideon and say, uh, looks like you raised a chicken. Does that mean that his daddy is a chicken, is a chicken too? And uh, history tells us they got their answer. They got their answer. And apparently these kings were very wealthy. They've got their pimped out camels, right? <laughs> even, their, even their camels are sport and bling, right? Gold chains. And uh, that just seems a little over the top. Going into battle, gold chains on your... <laughs> got them little Mr. T starter kits, you know. On them, right? So Gideon, for a keepsake, takes the ornaments that revealed their positions as kings. And did you notice the shape? Did you notice the shape of the ornaments? Did you notice the shapes? What are they? Yeah, they're crescent. They're crescent moon. They worship the moon god because they were Ishmaelites. How can we be sure they were Ishmaelites? From whom Muhammad, right? Muhammad, the founder of Islam, would eventually ascend from. Keep reading. Look at verse 22. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. That's what a good leader does. A good leader is always teaching you not to depend on the leader, but to depend on the leader's leader, right? The leader's God, the leader's Lord. You don't have to depend on the leader to help you do great things for the Lord. Just do them. Just do them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Good leader always points people to the Lord, and even though uh, it's no longer taught in schools, our nation's founders believed Jesus was the only king necessary. Got a little story for you. April 18th, 1775. John Hancock, remember? Signature guy. Yeah. Signed the, uh, what did he sign? What did he sign? What did he sign? Declaration of Independence. You know that most of the people that signed the Declaration of Independence were Christians, right? Um, a bunch of them were pastors. John Hancock and John Adams were staying in the home of a pastor in Lexington named Jonas Clark. You ever heard that name? He was part of what's known as the Black Robed Regiment. They were known for wearing a robe during the service, then taking it off to reveal an army uniform underneath it to go out and fight. Well, that night, Paul Revere, Paul Revere, he's the guy, you know, that would ride through, you know, the redcoats are coming, the redcoats are coming. Uh, the next morning, history records uh, the British major, I think his name is Pitcairn, uh, declares to the assembled Minutemen, he says this, disperse Ye villains, lay down. You've got to love 18th century speak, right? Disperse, ye villains, lay down your arms in the name of George, the sovereign king of England. And the immediate response from Jonas Clark was, we recognize, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. No king but Jesus. And that became the battle cry of the revolution. Why is that no longer taught in schools? I think we all know the reason for that, right? 
There's a guy named Jonathan Trumbull. Um, he was the crown appointed governor. Uh, he worked for uh, uh, King George. And, and he was kind of a historian. And one thing that he wrote is, if you ask an American who his master is, he will tell you that he has none but Jesus. How great is that? That was the reputation of our nation at its founding. Not that way no more, huh? So Gideon, Gideon has just offered, uh, well, he's just been offered the position of king and responded with what? God's going to be our king. Only God is going to rule over us. Look at verse 24. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder, for they had gold earrings because they were what? Ishmaelites, right? Told you to keep reading and we'd uh, uh, be assured these, uh, no, we know that these were the ancestors uh, to Muhammad. Verse 25, so they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now, the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around the camel's necks. That's... That's, that's just really brash and self-confident thing to do to, to, to deck out your camels with jewelry. You guys deck out your pets with jewelry? Don't tell me you put sweaters on your dogs and cats. I saw them little booties on the other day. It's a dog. It's a dog. They're little booties. They're built-in booties. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so what Gideon does, he takes up a collection of gold, and this total, you might want to write this in the column of your Bible, this is about 40 pounds of gold, 40 pounds of gold. Is he going to use the gold to buy himself an island in the Bahamas? Let's find out. Look at verse 27. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, the city of Ophrah, and all Israel, check this out, all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. As you know, who was supposed to wear the ephod? It's the priest, right? Just the high priest. The high priest would wear it. Um, it was made of a special cloth and decorated with 12 gemstones. What did the gemstones represent? The 12 tribes, right? Tribes of Israel. Now, the Bible tell, doesn't tell us why or what Gideon's motivation was for making the ephod. But I believe we can presume it was to give God glory and thanks for the victory since he had just done what? He had just turned down the opportunity to be king and to rule over them. He said that we only have one ruler, and that's Yahweh. Yet, as people do, they make an idol of it, and it becomes a snare for idolatry. And the people end up worshiping the visible thing instead of worshiping the invisible God. Oh, it's going to get worse. Look at verse 28. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for how long? For 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jerubbaal, right? That's another name for who? Gideon, right? Jerubbaal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his offspring, for he had mucho wives, many wives. Do you underline that in your Bibles? I think the word many is an understatement. Just exactly how many fillies did little Gideon have in his stable? We, we don't know for sure. He isn't close to Solomon, right? Solomon had 700 wives and 300 porcupines, I mean concubines, Right? <laughs> Plus, he has 70 sons and, well, and plus daughters, and it appears Gideon was taking seriously the call to be fruitful and multiply here, right? Now, Gideon has, we've watched him over the last several chapters. 
Gideon has done a whole bunch of things correctly. He's done a whole bunch of things right here. Um, but notice, there is no mention of him going back to farming. Remember, he's just a farmer. So even though he verbally told the people he didn't want to be king, it appears that what? He started acting. Yep, he started acting like a king. Certainly lived like them, having 10 or so wives. I'm thinking that'd be expensive. Right, men, isn't just having one wife expensive? No, <laughs> <laughs> ah, Verse 31. Hmm. Moving right along. Uh, look at, check this out. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son whose name was called Abimelech. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the, there's the Abbey people again, huh? The Abazirites. Now, obviously this Gideon was a rather prolific guy and apparently having uh, 10 or so wives wasn't enough. He also had a little chickadee on the side in, uh, in Shechem. And as we're going to find out next week, old Gideon should have been content with his harem of 10 or so because this this concubine kid, Abimelech, is not going to do good things. So, spoiler alert. If you liked, if you liked what happened uh, by Jael to Sisera in chapter 4, remember she was the one that put a tent peg through the, uh, through the general's melon. Why don't you just take a little nap and added a little iron to his diet, right? Put a tent peg through his through his melon. One stroke drilled it into the ground. That's a tough gal, right? Um, then you're going to love what happens to this, this Abimelech dude at the end of uh, chapter 9. So read ahead. I always encourage you, read, read ahead. Look at verse 33. So it was as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Berith their God. Look at the person next to you and say, not again. Not again. Not again. Oh. Baal Berith is a, is a Shechemite god whose name means Lord of the Covenant. Lord of the Covenant. They already had a covenant. They had a covenant with Yahweh. But they decide of all the gods to choose Baal Berith. Do you want to know why people can be this dumb? So do I. I, don't, I. I've never understood it. There is nothing logical about the sin and confess cycle that uh, uh, we see in the book of Judges. But you know, at the end of the book of Judges, what do we read? That every man did what was right in their own eyes. Nothing ever works out. Well, when that happens, the cycle over and over and over. What we do know is what the prophet Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is desperately wicked, meaning our propensity is not, even as believers, our propensity is not towards godliness. It's towards sinfulness. That's why we need to constantly be walking in the Spirit. Walk it in the spirit. Look at verse 34, last verse, uh, last two verses for tonight. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, that's Gideon, obviously, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. This, of course, once again, is carnal nature on full display. Not only do they forget about God, they forget about God's faithful leaders who dedicate their lives to pointing people to God. I've heard so many pastors say leadership is lonely. Leadership is lonely because so few have any comprehension of the sacrifice and how it feels for them and anybody in ministry and their families to be treated so poorly at times by those that God has given them stewardship to, uh, to shepherd. Yeah, here's the deal. 
if those people are wise, they're just going to remember that, that, that we serve as unto the Lord, not into man. So we shouldn't be looking for our kudos from man. We should be looking to them from uh, the Lord. And the Lord is always faithful, always faithful to, uh, to, uh, to bless those who are faithful to him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for another adventure in your word. You've taught us a lot tonight. You've taught us some things where Gideon can definitely be our role model and some things where we probably shouldn't follow in his footsteps. Thank you that he was a man of faith who you called to lead 300 men to end up taking out 135,000 Midianites. Lord, you can do extraordinary things through very, very ordinary people. Lord, we've all been hurt. We've all been wounded. We all know what it's like to have somebody stick a dagger in our back, maybe even stick a dagger in our front, and yet somebody has to be the adult in the room. And I pray that you would fill us with your power to really exercise what it means to be kind and compassionate with one another, forgiving one another, uh, with tender mercies as, as, uh, as God has forgiven us. It's supernatural, or we, we can't do that in our own strength. We can only do that through the power of the Holy Ghost. And tonight, God, uh, as we study um, in small group, God, help us to have great discussion, uh, great interaction, uh, great insight and relevance uh, for our daily living. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.